I'm very tempted to do the entire video like this, but I will not. Um, I'm going to do the question and answer thing now. Um, thank you for all the questions. I've, I've had a, an influx of them. It's quite startling. Um, how do I hold the camera for this? Yeah, that's fine, isn't it? Um, what are you studying? I'm studying archaeology in Preston and I'm on an integrated master's course. So linguistics started out as a secondary thing and it slowly became more and more significant. You know, I think I, I got into it through an interest in Cumbrian and at first I didn't really know how it worked. You know, I was just clutching connections from any, anywhere I could see them. Um, but there's a lot of coincidence in linguistics. You can't just grab at connections where, wherever you see them. You have to apply some sort of methodology to it. Um, you know, having access to a university library has been really, really helpful in, you know, being able to look into actual academic literature about linguistics and about historical linguistics, about sound change, reconstruction and things like that, which I didn't have access to before. Um, so now I think I, I apply the methodology a lot better than I did. But of course, there are still a load of shortcomings. There'll always be a load of shortcomings. Um, another, th another thing that got me into, I think, is that I like thinking about historical people doing normal things and behaving in, in a normal way on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the most universal things that everybody does is speech. Um, that's why I made that casual conversation video a while ago, because I think we don't really think of people in the past as having genuinely casual conversations that really don't amount to anything. But they did. They did. You know, they must have done. Um, so that was partly what prompted me to take up the Anglo-Saxon Thing and make the Anglo-Saxon video the desire to present an ancient language as uh, a working language and not just something to sort of write poems or, or chant verses in. Now on the subject of the Anglo-Saxon video, a lot of people asked about the pronunciations in the Anglo-Saxon video, understandably, and that's a, an important one. Um, we don't have any recordings of Anglo-Saxons speaking and you can't reconstruct the fine, fine details of accent just through text. But you can tell a lot more than you'd think. So, for example, things like whether a r, whether an r was rolled in West Saxon Old English, or whether you had a velar l sound as opposed to an alveolar l sound. Um, these are things that characterise accents nowadays, and they're things that we can actually have educated debates about for Old English. People, let me scroll. People don't exactly know how the R in Old English was realised. It was probably realised in a number of different ways depending on where you live, what your accent was. Um, but based on how sounds around the R have developed, we can actually make educated guesses as to what the quality of it was, whether it was a, a R like in German, whether it was a R like in uh, Spanish, or a R like in Standard English. And most sources seem to indicate that in a lot of places it was R. Um, I'll probably do a video on that at some point um, because there are a lot of current debates about how certain letter combinations or letters were articulated in Old English, pronounced in Old English. Um, as for how I got it sounding natural, when you look into Old English pronunciation what you'll often find is um, analogies between the Old English pronunciation and an, uh, an equivalent sound in modern English, which are very imprecise, like they're useful. So you might, for example, it might say, this letter sounds like the A ah in the word cat. Um, it's useful to somebody who, who's a sort of beginner at pronunciation, but it's really, really imprecise because obviously it, that depends on your accent. And it, it might be that certain sounds that exist in modern English didn't even exist in Old English. Um, some of these guides will even use a diphthong, a gliding vowel, as an analogy from an Old English monophthong. So a diphthong is, a monophthong is a vowel where you keep the same articulation in your mouth. Your tongue stays in the whole plate the same time. Your tongue stays in the same place the whole time you're pronouncing it. So like or, e, e. Um, whereas a diphthong is a gliding vowel where your tongue moves, the vowel changes in articulation while you're saying it. So like O, A, you see what I mean? Um, and some of these guides, pronunciation guides, will represent, for example, the Old English pronoun we, as in like us, 
um, they will say it's pronounced like way, whereas in fact it had a monophthongal pronunciation, e, we. Um, to, to describe it use in terms a modern English speaker understands is kind of useful, but it's not very precise. So if you want a natural sounding um, pronunciation, I'd say the first thing you've got to do is drag yourself out of the phonology you're used to uh, and look at phonology objectively, like pull up an IPA chart or something like that and just practice the sounds without thinking about this is like this sound in my language because that's that's where you sort of start to sound a bit unnatural. Um, this is a good way of practicing a, a different accent within within your own language as well. Um, I'm realizing these answers are, are getting quite long so I'll probably have to do um, a, another video on this one at some point. This is from um, Alex Grimshaw. How did Old English differ throughout the heptarchy? Now this is interesting and something I've been thinking about making a video on as well. Um, it's a good question because dialects aren't something we necessarily think about in ancient languages. Um, I, I don't know anything about dialects in Latin, for example, although there must have been dialects in Latin. People say there were four major dialects of Old English, which were West Saxon, Mercian, Kentish and Northumbrian. Um, I think it was probably more of a spectrum going up the country. Um, you know, from village to village there might have been minor changes, and then if you travelled a hundred miles you might have trouble understanding people. Now, you mentioned the the thing in the comment, um, mentioned the, the word the being Northumbrian. Now the definite article, which are words corresponding to the word the in English, um, used to have a variety of forms depending on grammatical gender and case. So you know Spanish has two genders, masculine and feminine. Old English had three genders, masculine, feminine, neuter, like German does. Um, it was in Northumbria that the boundaries between the grammatical genders started to break down. So the way you indicate that the grammatical gender of a word is by the form of the definite article you put in front of it and also inflections on adjectives and um, adjectives? Verbs? The verb? I don't know. <sighs> I don't know. But you, you inflect um, things according to the gender of the word that you're applying it to, if you see what I mean. Um, so once you have only one form of the definite article and you don't have very much inflection, the boundaries between grammatical genders start to break down and the concept doesn't really apply anymore, which is why nowadays we don't have grammatical gender. And as you say, this started to happen in uh, Northumbrian Old English. That's when we first notice it. And it started to make its way south and now nobody uses grammatical gender in English. Um, there were other differences too. Now I'm, I'm, I know most about the differences between Northumbrian and West Saxon. I don't know much about Mercian and Kentish, but um, a, a big difference between Northumbrian and West Saxon. So there's this thing which affects English and Frisian called palatalization. And that is that certain consonants, places of articulation move closer to the hard palate in, in, you know, in the middle of all the upper teeth. Um, so, for example, a k sound, you know, a sound that was originally k becomes ch, or a sound that was originally g becomes j at the end of a word. Um, now, this palatalization, palatalization, sorry, didn't affect um, northern dialects for a very long time. So that's why in northern place names, northern English place names, you get elements like brig and rig, where in the south you'd have bridge and ridge. Um, so you'll, you'll, you'll get an Old Norse influence as well towards the end of the Old English period, so prepositions like til instead of to and fro instead of from, which is where to and fro come, well, no, actually, no, to is the standard English, fro is where the fro in to and fro comes from. Is there any relationship between Welsh and Old English? That's from Blainpunt or something like that. There is, but it's very distant. So for people who don't know, languages descend from each other in a sort of family tree structure. And if you go back far enough, English and Dutch are related, English and German are related, cousins of each other, you know. But you have to go back a very long way to find a common ancestor with Welsh. 
all the way back to what's called Proto-Indo-European, which I would suggest you look up if you, if you don't know much about it, because it's really interesting. Um, this was probably spoken about 4,000 years ago, maybe a bit more. So they are related, but really not, you know... Old, Old English doesn't have Celtic roots, it's, it's, it's purely continental Germanic. Although there are suggestions that certain aspects of English grammar might be from Celtic influence, but I might talk about that another time. Um, Percival uh, Irakanth, I'm really sorry if I'm pronouncing these badly, um, says, what are your thoughts on Anglish? Now, Anglish is a sort of movement to re germanicize English and replace, for example, French-derived words, Greek-derived words, with um, Germanic equivalents by taking German words and calcing them, di directly translating them to English or, you know, things like that. Um, I think it's a cool sort of project. I don't think there's any deep need to make the language Germanic again. You know, language changes, loan words get picked up. Um, it, it works just as well with French and Greek words as it would with, with natively, you know, Anglo-Saxon words. It, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference to how, how well we can communicate with each other. But it's an interesting thought experiment, sort of calcing German words to English and things like that. It's very interesting. Um, a couple of people have, have noted the lack of content. I'm very sorry about that. Now, this is because while I'm at university, I don't normally take my camera with me and I don't have my editing software. So I have to do things on my phone. So it's sort of a toss up between doing nice looking videos very rarely and filling the channel with these phone videos. So. Now I've actually got a sort of an audience, I think I'll probably go home a bit more often. Um, I'm popping back up the weekend after this one, so I'll try and do something then. Um, then, as I say, the next week I'll go back again. But yeah, I'll probably start getting involved in more projects and things now. I know this isn't as niche a, sub uh, niche a subject as I had initially thought it was. Um, and I might even start bringing my camera up here, but my room isn't the most scenic place. Um, I'll probably do another one of these in a few days because I've realised how little I've actually got through. Um, there's lots and lots of interesting comments. I just went through the first ones that were on the list, but there's there's loads of very interesting ones. So I'll, I'll do another one, one of one of these in a few days. Um, yeah, a lot of the questions are making me think about things that I hadn't thought about before. So thank you very much. Um, I'll do maybe there's time for one more. The Rockall Times, Simon, what influence do you think Old English has had on the furry phenomenon? Right, listen to you, you fucking bastard. Just because once in the 1950s I was photographed sucking off a mouse does not implicate me in any sort of broader furry phenomenon, not that I have anything against those who are implicated therein, and another thing.